Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 5 of the video series on computational models. In the previous tutorials we have been discussing how to encode signed and unsigned integers into computer hardware. Even though there is still a lot more to be said about the encoding of integers and signed integers and the implementation of the operations on these objects, we will reserve this discussion for a bit later. Since we need to be able to do division on integer objects in any way, we may as well start gaining some familiarity with fractions. So as the story goes, fractions in general are very complicated objects to deal with in terms of capturing all the relevant and necessary properties or features that such a wide or broad spectrum of objects may have. We can think of the spectrum sigma as the set of all objects that are real numbers, in other words the join or the union of the rationals and irrationals where the rationals are those that are terminal or recurring and irrationals is the complement of the rationals, in other words those numbers that are acyclic and non-terminal. Here's a list of some properties, features or predicates on types of numbers, specifically fractions that theoretical computer scientists and electrical engineers are generally interested in or take into consideration when designing circuits and uh, digital electronics and algorithms to implement for fractions as well as some outline of the design and deciding factors on how to best model or design the properties and the behavior of fractions into computer hardware. What makes these numerical objects so complicated to deal with is largely due to the fact that rational and irrational objects have some similarities in terms of their expanded notation, but are quite distinct in all other major aspects. There is some sort of gap between the rationals and the irrationals, and more will be said about Cantor's uncountably infinite and diagonal argument later to solidify the theoretical notions of rationals and irrationals. Some aspects that are taken into consideration when constructing a model for working with fractions include the following. The recurring or terminating nature of a number object, whether it's rational or irrational, the representation and or the encoding of how to store these objects into computer hardware and what is the best way to do this, as well as the natural ordering and relational algebras, um, in other words, the attempt to capture the well-ordering principle from mathematics. Furthermore, some numeric or theoretical aspects and theorems and algorithms to define operations on these objects. Also, the application or extension to other disciplines such as calculus analysis, complex analysis, differential equations, discrete mathematics, and the list goes on. Another aspect that's quite important is, of course, the circuitry, the hardwiring of digital algorithms physical and algorithmic complexity, okay, as well as the limitations and many more theoretical aspects. Basically, computers run on theory. The crazy thing about computer science is the requirement of knowledge of a vast amount of mathematical disciplines. The first reason is for understanding the theories and fitting the pieces together. And secondly, because each field of rigorous mathematics has limitations and restrictions that are required to be understood to form a complete or functioning system when implementing the key concept and then translating the theories to hardware via techniques borrowed from physics and electronic engineers. Computer scientists aim to best preserve as much as possible the existing properties or features that our number systems have when deciding on how to encode these objects, fractions. In other words, numbers on paper are very different from numbers in hardware. But we try our best to mimic the existing number theoretic frameworks that we have with some necessary tweaks here and there to make things faster or more efficient. The type of a number, whether it be a rational, an irrational, an integer or a positive integer or any other user defined object like a complex number endowed with their operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, taking the square root and any other operations provides insights about the algorithmic nature of the operations themselves as well as the numbers to which the operations are being applied. In this context, the numbers or arguments take on the form of parameters 
for the operations which can be considered functions of addition, subtraction, lift and right pitch shift, multiplication, division and taking the square root. More will be said about the difference between parameters and arguments later. The pitch shift operations correspond to the usual operations of shifting the comma, the dot, the decimal point or the floating point in an expression like for example 1.234 multiplied by the radix or base 10 to the second power has the effect of shifting the decimal point two places to the right. And this procedure works in exactly the same way for binary base 2 encoding of integers. For example, 1001.0110 in this sequence of bits, the floating point is shifted by three places to the right and can be expressed symbolically as follows. To gain some intuition, let's verify that the right bit shifting by one unit for the above binary sequence corresponds to dividing its equivalent decimal base 10 representation by 2. We do this by looking at the number in two different ways. First, we translate the number to its decimal equivalent by breaking it up into its integer part and the mantissa. In the second view, we first bit shift the number right by one unit and then convert it to its decimal equivalent. We can observe that the results obtained in the previous steps gives us the same decimal base 10 number 4.6875. The bit shift is not always negligible. The underflow increases the more that we perform right bit shift and throw away significant bits. Nevertheless, by pretending we have enough space to the left and to the right of a binary number, the above expressions translates to primitive programming symbols without regards of over or underflow. Shifting a binary number right by one unit, a negative power of two, has the same effect as dividing its corresponding integer value by two as long as the least significant bit is not a 1, in which case we would get an underflow, in other words, a loss of precision because the last bit gets thrown out and the result is actually a tiny bit smaller than what we would expect to get, given that we had no more cells available to actually store the new number than the original number. And shifting a binary number left by one unit, in other words, one power of two, has the same effect as multiplying its corresponding integer value by two, as long as the most significant bit is not a one, in which case we would get an overflow, in other words, a bigger number than what the allocated number of bits can handle for that specific data type. Bit shift operations are clearly very fundamental. Bit shift operations in programming is often used in algorithms to generate a rough first guesstimate for certain approximations. Bit shift operations also play a role in Booth's hardware multiplication algorithm and elsewhere, as we will later see. Note that arithmetic right shift and logical right shift are subtly different where Google is your best friend. So we've already encountered some division operations on the hardware, albeit only by powers of two, but this procedure is very efficient and is indispensable to other routines that depend on it. We often call these operations elementary or primitive because much of the other operations uh, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and taking the square root of a number can be reduced to using mainly bit shift operations and some other elementary routines reserved for another tutorial. This concept is strong in computer science and mathematics in general and is usually encapsulated by the concept of functional completeness and existence of algebraically closed expressions. In other words, we can define the other operations in terms of more primitive or elementary operations, like bit shift. This is often advantageous since we get to pick and choose which operations we would like to keep, and quite often we base that decision on whether our implementation of algorithms would be more efficient. Let's first talk a little bit more about this for a minute, because it's very important to try and understand exactly what we are trying to achieve. Well, similar to how we can define multiplication as repeated addition, we often seek to define other operations like division and square root of a number in terms of more elementary operations. This is totally achievable in many different ways. For a large part of the series, we will investigate just exactly how these operations can be defined on the hardware level to be as efficient as possible. Similarly, we can define division in terms of repeated subtraction, where the above expression subtracts p from a until there's r less than q remaining. And q will be 
the answer for integer division or the quotient. This is just standard Euclidean division. Strictly speaking, this is not exactly how these operations are defined on the hardware level, but it gets the points across and highlights some important architectural design decisions or trade-offs that electronic engineers and computer scientists make. It illustrates the concept of adequacy or functional completeness that is so often used when making strategic decisions in programming and computing in general. It is true, however, that division can be defined in terms of multiplication, as we will discuss further in another episode. Thus, software engineers often prefer to write driver code that performs the division operations on the abstract program level, which under the hood makes use of multiplication and bit operations on the hardware level, thus reducing the complexity of the division procedures in circuitry. In the past, this has been quite a cumbersome task to build, even though modern computers are still designed in this way to perform the division operations on the circuitry of the floating point unit arithmetic chipset. Some manufacturers write driver code while others build the circuitry to do all the fundamental or elementary operations. We reiterate that the distinction between types of numbers are extremely important. Like for example, the following two operations computations have very different algorithmic implementations because as mentioned above algorithmic implementations for each may vary and we gain insights about the limitations of the number system at hand as well as the interaction of their operations plus minus times divide root keep in mind certain operations applied to numbers or fractions can behave differently for different types of numbers or fractions certain fractions or terminal or recurring which is considered a good thing in terms of a property to have while others are not in other words certain fractions are irrational seemingly without a pattern a worse property to have because it's more difficult or complicated to model these infinite string type of numbers into computer hardware which by the way is not exactly the most formal characterization of an irrational number the correct characterization of an irrational number is by definition a number which cannot be expressed as a fraction as having a finite numerator and denominator even though it can be expressed in dot or float point notation by some algorithmic procedure to generate the digits to some desired accuracy thus for rational numbers either one the number stops after some string of digits it is the mantissa is finite where the mantissa is the tail of a fraction, the string of bits after the dot or the comma. We will no longer refer to the dot comma as a decimal point because in this context, it may be more appropriate to call it a binary point, but that just sounds weird. So we'll stick to calling it a dot or a point. And two, the number has a recurring cycle of digits, for example, 0 0.1231231231123 recurring. We reiterate the meaning of the mantissa, the fraction part of the number. In other words, the string of digits after the dot. We will henceforth refer to this representation of a number as the dot notation or point notation or float point notation of a fraction. For example, in the context of irrational numbers, to say that the mantissa is the fraction part of an irrational number is technically incorrect since an irrational number is not actually a fraction at all but only mimics the behavior of a fraction in terms of its expanded notation or point dot representation. Think of irrational as erratic in the sense that the number has some sort of unpredictable behavior. Quote unquote, we cannot tell what the next digit will be by merely looking at the number from a human's perspective, which is also not entirely true since we can actually tell if we have a, pr a procedure that generates the next digit. Consider for a minute why this is problematic in terms of computer hardware. Why is it a problem that certain numbers cannot be written as fractions? We have already sort of established that this is due to the fact that irrational numbers are those that are generated by some mathematical procedure that expands in dot or point notation to an arbitrary number of digits, but cannot be written as a fraction as having a finite numerator and denominator in over D. Some examples include Euler's number, which is again an irrational number, 
produced by some algorithm, the golden ratio phi, the square root of two. Clearly, computers need to be able to handle such numbers with ease, not only in terms of storage, but also in terms of algorithms performed on such numbers. Computer scientists come up with the ideas of how these numbers should be manipulated in terms of computer programming and hardware. For the expanded notation of fractions explained above, we will study the entire spectrum sigma of numbers collectively by expressing numbers algebraically in point dot notation as follows. x equals lambda dot eta 1, eta 2, eta 3, all the way through to some finite index eta m, then followed by chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, and so on. Notice that for the number 3 over 2, which is 1.5, the whole part lambda is 1 and can be separated from the mantissa mu, which is 0.5, so that in most cases we will be mainly interested in the mantissa. Moreover, the chi digits or the tail of the expression is all zeros and the eta or the finite part is of length n equals 1. For the number 1 divided by 7, the whole part lambda equals 0, so here we are dealing with the mantissa only of the form, 0.142857, having a cycle of digits of length n equals 6, while the tail, the chi part, is all zeros. For the mathematical constant pi, which is approximately 3.141592, etc., the whole part is lambda equals 3, and the mantissa is broken up into a finite part of length 0, an infinite string of chi's, where each chi subscript i is to be determined by some internally defined procedure, like some algorithm, to determine a specified number of digits up to some precision. Similarly, for our algebraic expression, x equals lambda plus mu, we can separate it into parts, as the whole part lambda, which is an integer, and the mantissa part mu, eta1, eta2, eta3, all the way through to eta, some finite subscript m, then followed by g1, g2, g3, and so on, which represents the possibly uh, or potentially recurring or an irrational part of the number. If n is zero, in other words, the eta terms, the finite part of the expression vanishes, and x takes on the form of a purely irrational number, having only g terms, g1, g2, g3, ad infinitum. In the second case, the g terms or the tail of the mantissa may also only contain a finite number of terms or digits. In this case, the number is rational and recurring. Hence, we are generally interested in proving statements about numbers of the form containing a whole part, a finite part, and a possibly non-terminal and a cyclic part, or a recurring part. Star is representative of the most general form of a number in the spectrum while hash is a representative of the rational proper subclass of the spectrum which are also of importance to us now we are ready to state and prove one of the most fundamental facts about the expanded dot point notation of a fraction n over d in the base radix b that characterizes the behavior of numbers in terms of being rational recurring versus rational terminal by merely looking at the prime factors of the base b and the prime factors of the denominator of the fraction d. The theorem states that a fraction, if expressed in expanded point or dot notation, will be recurring if and only if the denominator has prime factors that do not appear in the prime factors of the base or the radix. The converse of the statement is also quite simply stated as follows. If the denominator d of the fraction 1 over d or n over d has prime factors that are only prime factors of the base radix b, then the fraction n over d cannot be recurring. It is, the expanded dot floating point notation must be terminal. So that brings us to the conclusion of episode 5. In the next tutorial, we will look at a proof of this fact and some examples.